Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN Weekly for Saturday, September 19th, 2020. And our top story this week, European countries begin to look at defined contribution programs. Well, joining me now to discuss this and more is John Mitchum. He's the principal of JM3 Projects. John, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Hi, Jeff. It's great to, great to see you as always. And you know, we several weeks ago, we chatted with Darren Philp of Smart Pension about what's going on in the UK in terms of defined contribution versus defined benefit. And, you know, I think we want to take a more global look. And I know you have a lot of expertise and experience in what's going on in Europe and the former Soviet Union. So why don't you kind of take us through what you're seeing out there right now? Well, I'll give you the quick tour. Um, it's a lot of geography. Um, uh, so Netherlands and UK have had strong DB for many years, and they are converting that to DC for a lot of reasons, portability, flexibility, people don't have the long job tenures, very similar to here. Um, in main, the main body of central continental Europe has traditionally gone with pay-as-you-go pensions provided by governments. Um, just you can imagine the state of that, financial crisis, COVID, aging, demographics, it's a problem. Yep. So they're trying to figure out funded solutions. And no one on earth is creating DB pensions per se, but they are creating defined contribution savings plans analogous to 401ks or Australia superannuation. So that's moving forward. Um, so we're converting DB to DC. Legislation is in place in Brussels and at the national level to create DC options, sort of IRA type of things. And then a third one, which is, it came up in our conference that we did with Spark and DCIA that you're referring to, um, is that uh, Europe has at least $10 trillion in what we, 10 trillion euros, in what we consider to be sort of stranded assets. And by, by this we mean, bank accounts, insurance products, and real estate investments that are sort of earmarked, if you want to use a behavioral finance term, sort of mentally earmarked for retirement, but they're not really retirement vehicles. So you've got people using short-term vehicles for a long-term financial goal, which is a problem. So what colleagues of mine in Europe are trying to do, and we're talking and helping and getting involved with them, is to not only create new defined contribution systems, but also to help convert this stock of investment into a, a, a purpose-built retirement format that will look an awful lot like a 401k or an IRA. Well, John, in, in terms of, you know, all, all these things, uh, you know, these are different cultures, different, you know, they have traditionally used defined benefit plans. You know, typically here in the U.S., when you make a change to any benefit, there's a little bit of resistance. Have yeah. you seen, I mean, you know, it's, it's probably an understatement, right, John? I mean, you and no, I No, look, I was, I, w I was in France in 2018. I, I sort of, I did, I was like four months in, in Europe that winter and um, met everybody I could and made a lot of colleagues. And those were some of the people you saw in the conference. Um, and uh, that was the time when the Gilets Jaunes protests were happening in Paris. Now, pa Paris is sort of my base because my wife is French and we have an apartment there. And um, the Gilets Jaunes began as a protest to gasoline taxes. That's where it began. And a week later, it was about pensions. I mean, because look, the biggest single factor of macroeconomics in France, as China, as Japan, as the United States, and everywhere else, is global aging. So the structures that were built for the 20th century, high interest rates, robust population growth, um, uh, small numbers of retirees, as you know, they're just caving in. So it went right to that. And now it's become a mess because it's politics, right? So unions, uh, people with a vested interest, insurers that have these policies that don't necessarily want to see people leave the insurance sector and go to purpose-built retirement savings vehicles. Now, what I tried to communicate to them was that the United U.S. mutual fund industry was largely created and owned by the insurers because they adapted to the changing market. Right. So we're trying to convince them, go with it. You know, this is, a, this is the solution, but you've got to do it so that you do it with a European way, a European face, and even, as you suggest, within your Europe, you know, Italy, Spain, Denmark, Germany, you're going to have to have national characteristics. We have to be flexible to that because culture, as you point out, is a very powerful factor, but it's very difficult to put on a spreadsheet. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's qualitative, right? And if you're just looking at numbers, yeah, I think it makes it can make sense to do this. And I think about the same thing here in the public sector in the U.S. You know, it makes sense on paper, but when you think about attracting a police force, attracting firefighters, people who are putting their lives on the line, uh, especially in today's environment, and you know, only work they have a finite amount of time to work. Yeah, you've got to be able to have some level of benefit to attract those people. And so it's very important right. to kind of take all of those things into consideration, I would think. Yeah, and, it's, and, it's, and you know, even the U.S. is diverse, right? I mean, Utah has got 130% of, 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 of liabilities. It's well stocked up. It's a terrific state pension plan. Illinois, New Jersey, not so much. So it, it varies, you know. Um, what we have to do, though, is basically accept the inevitable. Um, these governments, be they U.S. states or global governments, um, they're going to have to step back from this role a little bit. And if you give people a choice between DB and DC, what we're finding in Europe and what we're finding in several states in the U.S., they will, they will choose DC. I mean, new workers into the North Carolina or, or, or Oregon government, um, they'll often tick off the box and choose a, D, a, D, a DC option because they don't, you know, the long-term liability of the DB structure is a, has a question mark over it. And so they, uh, they want to go and have owned assets, plus which if they, you know, it's more, more portable, you don't have to wait 20 years for vesting. There are all these reasons. Um, so we're trying to get people to do this in a way that is consistent with your circumstances, but also faces reality. And this could be good for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's portable. You can people people tend to move around more. They can go country to country, city to city. John, I want to ask you about, you know, here in the States, you're in Cal beautiful California. You can see the lovely garden in the background uh, at your home office. Um, I pay a lot of taxes for this, Jeff. So I, I, I know. And, and that's money that could be put away in your retirement plan, by the way. No, darn it. You know, I know. Um, but what I was going to say is here in the U.S., we've got the Secure Act and trying to put people into retire, you know, think about retirement income. And in the U, in the, uh, in Europe and, and around the world, are people a little bit more understanding about annuities and annuitization and thinking about retirement income differently? You know, here in the US, we have, we're just like, we hear the word annuity and everyone goes, ah, you know, right? Not, not you know, they're not, re not really, because look, um, I was at a, a conference in Paris at the, uh, uh, the French Association of, As of uh, Financial Advisors, which is one of the organizations that I sort of I, I sneak my way into and we, we talk. Um, and um, they said, look, in the 1960s, 1970s, you had low risk, high uh, interest rates. Um, it was perfect. All you had to do was toss the money into a basket for government bonds. The government got the money it needed. You were getting 5% with no risk. That's great. Well, among the pressures that we haven't talked about, we talked about demographics and you know, aging and all that, is simple interest rate risk. I mean, interest rates have been on a downward slide since 1980. Uh, they're now returning basically zero. So what does that do to that other option? I mean, it just obliterates it. This is far beyond us in the retirement industry. Yeah. This, is macro, this is macroeconomic policy. This is central banking. So that's like arguing with the, the law of gravity. I mean, those interest rates are going to eliminate a certain kind of traditional structure. Yeah. Absolutely. But we can, we can work with them. And I would make the case, obviously, that if you own assets and you own risk, i.e. equities and other things in a suitable architecture, target date fund, glide path type of architecture, you can take advantage of the asset appreciation that comes with this lower interest rates. Because if you depend on interest rates, it's not going to be good. That said, it does have to be converted to cash at the back end. Now, that is going to be the growth product sector of the global retirement, pension, wealth management industry of the next decade. And there's a lot of smart people working on it. Algos, formulations for drawdown that allow you to stay exposed to risk, to continue to grow your assets because you're going to live a long time, but also modulate the, 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 the income that you can derive pushing it perhaps to the back end where you may annuitize when you're 60, but you're not going to start drawing that cash till you're 80. Things like, you know, de deferred income annuities. It's a lot of smart people working on this and it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be great. There's going to be a lot of solutions coming up. Yeah. A lot of solutions and a lot of change. Well, John, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on the program 
Uh, very interesting topics, and we look forward to revisiting with this with you in the future and discussing yeah, keep other one things. Number, keep one number going, $20 trillion. We're going we're gonna to convert $10 trillion in stranded assets in Europe, and we're going to create $10 trillion in new DC. Can't give you the calendar, but that's our, that's our target. Absolutely. John, thank you so much. Great to talk okay. with you. We'll talk to you soon. See you next time, amigo. Good. Thanks, John. Great to see you. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. The windows on our homes, they protect us in the ones we love, but they do much more. At Renewal by Anderson, making your home more comfortable is at the center of every window we make. It's why we custom build our windows in America and install them in as little as one day. It's why we build our frames with exclusive Fibrex composite material that's two times stronger than vinyl. It's why our glass helps keep your home warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and quieter all year long. It's why we stand behind every window with a 20-year limited warranty. Why not help lower your energy costs while giving your home and family the best? Call 1-800-835-6525 to schedule a free in-home consultation. Buy one, get one at 40% off with this special offer. Plus, get special financing with no money down, no monthly payments, and no interest for one full year. Renewal by Anderson, the better way to a better window. Call 1-800-835-6525 now. Welcome back. On Monday, I sit down with J.P. Morgan Asset Management's David Kelly to talk about the impact of the new Fed interest rate policy on investors. Let's take a look. Yes, well, I think there, there are really two things going on at the same time with Federal Reserve policy, which are both very interesting. The first is that since this pandemic started, uh, the Federal Reserve has adopted some very extreme, what they would call QE or quantitative easing. But really what that means is they're building up their balance sheet. And the way they're doing that is they're buying treasury bonds in massive quantities on the open market. In fact, since the start of the year, they've bought 2.2 trillion dollars worth of treasury bonds and they're adding about a trillion dollars per year to that now why is that so important because guess who you know you know who's supplying those the u.s treasury is well, what we're seeing is massive government budget deficits which are essentially being monetized or financed by the federal reserve fast and all steve mnuchin is printing new bonds jay powell is buying them up now now if monetary policy itself is not particularly powerful at promoting economic growth People don't really care about what long-term interest rates are, really, when it comes to business decisions. But if you use these low long-term rates and if you use all this Fed power to buy bonds to enable the federal government to have massive tax cuts, uh, one-time checks to individuals, higher unemployment benefits, more infrastructure spending, if you do all of that, then you can generate more economic growth and more inflation. So monetary policy has suddenly become much more powerful because it's being used as a tool really to finance very expansionary fiscal policy. 
That's one thing they're doing. Um, a second thing that I think is really interesting is, is the Fed's adoption of average inflation targeting. Now, the idea is this. They, in the long run, and for, for many years, they've had a target of hitting 2% inflation uh, as measured by something called the personal consumption deflator. That's what they wanted to get to. But for years, they've actually seen an inflation rate come in below that target. And so inflation's always been lower than the Fed said it was going to be. And, and one of the effects of that is it's lowered people's expectations. People don't really expect high inflation. And for various reasons, it's a good idea. The Fed finds it useful if people expect somewhat higher inflation. So they're, they're really focused on, well, how do we get people to expect more inflation? And their bright idea is, well, what we'll do is if we've run below for a few years, what we'll try and do is run above that target for a few years. So on average, it looks like we're kind of hitting 2%. Now, personally, I don't think that's a very good idea. I mean, it's, it's kind of like if you go around all winter in, in, in a T-shirt, you decide you're going to wear a heavy sweater in the summer. Um, because, and I think that we will end up with higher inflation because of this. But it really is a very expansionary policy. If you think back over the years, it used to be that central bankers tried to raise interest rates before inflation became a problem. Now, I remember central bankers used to say, I'm going to take away the punch bowl before the party gets out of hand. Then under people like Ben Bernanke and Jen, uh, Janet Yellen, they were data dependent. OK, as soon as you see the whites of the eyes of inflation, then we'll raise rates, but not before. Now, under Jay Powell, the, this policy of average inflation targeting is we're going to get let inflation in the door. It's going to be playing around. Inflation is going to be above where we want it to be before we even react. And so it's a very dovish policy. And it's, it's a dangerous policy because, of course, inflation could begin to get too high then. And you know, the only way the Federal Reserve can control it is by pushing up interest rates. But if they push up interest rates, think about all that government debt that's being financed now um, at very low interest rates. You've got to finance that at higher interest rates. You've got some fiscal problems. So I think it's a dangerous combination, which will lead to higher inflation, but potentially real fiscal problems in the middle of this decade. I think this is a market of extremes in, um, in terms of very high valuations for large cap growth stocks and frankly, very high valuations for also things like long term bonds because the yields are so low. But there is a boring middle in capital markets, which I think is being ignored. U.S. value stocks are actually priced perfectly normally, particularly if you expect that the economy is going to recover. And international stocks, both emerging market stocks and developed country international stocks, are about as cheap relative to U.S. stocks as they've been at any time in the last 20 years. And so I think, if, if, I think what people should do is have the discipline to be diversified. Um, I know it's, it's tempting either to get very scared uh, or very, very greedy here. But what people need to be is balanced, have that diversified portfolio. I think you should protect against inflation. Make sure you own a home if you can, um, have some real assets, but also invest in things that make sense from a valuation perspective. You know, these are unprecedented, unprecedented times, but you still got to think your way through them in, in order to make good investment decisions. I think that's why people need good financial advice. But it's also a time when people really need to be very disciplined in how they think about things rather than getting carried away with the positive or negative emotion of markets. You know, I always tell people, don't let how you feel about politics overrule how you think about investing. Um, I think there are a lot of people, a lot of Republicans would invest during Ob Obama's term in office and the market went up and a lot of Democrats would invest when Donald Trump was in office and the market went up. So don't, you know, I think that's the first point I'd make. Second of all, with regard to the election itself, the truth is it's too early to know. Um, you know, at the moment, Joe Biden has a lead over Donald Trump, but we're still eight weeks away or seven weeks away from the election. Um, it's too early to tell. And then the other thing is, you know, even if we knew how the election was going to turn out, recent experience says that, you know, even given the result, the markets behaved in an odd way um, and in an unpredictable way. So I wouldn't uh, make too many bets here. The one thing I would say is that there are three possible outcomes. You could have a Republican sweep, you could have a Democratic sweep, or you can have a Democratic president with a Republican Congress. What you won't have is Donald Trump getting reelected and the Congress remaining in Democratic hands. So if Donald Trump is reelected, he's going to be in a very powerful position. Um, I think if, if Joe Biden is elected with a uh, you know, Democratic sweep, that will also be a powerful position. In both cases, I think you'd see an expansionary fiscal policy. But if you have divided government, then I think you will see a pullback and more gridlock in terms of fiscal policy, and that could actually lead to a slower economy and a slower recovery in 21 or 22 than, uh, than we expect under uh, a sweep in either direction. And on Wednesday, I sat down with the Institute of Student Loan Advisors, Betsy Mayotte, to lay out a game plan for paying back student loans in 2021. Let's take a look. In our last episode, um, we talked about how uh, due to COVID, 
uh, Congress passed the CARES Act uh, in the spring. And what the CARES Act did is that for those borrowers with federally held federal student loans, which is about two thirds, maybe 80% of federal loan borrowers, uh, their payments are on hold and they have 0% interest. And even better, if they're pursuing a forgiveness program such as public service loan forgiveness or one of the income driven plans, this period counts towards those forgiveness programs, which is really unprecedented. Um, so that was due to end on September 30th. Uh, on August 8th, the president signed an executive order that extended uh, part of those provisions to December 31st. Um, the Department of Education took it a step further and actually just said, listen, we're putting a blanket extension. Everything that was in the CARES Act, we're applying to this executive order. So the same group of borrowers, no payments due until at least after December 31st. That could, there's the opportunity to extend that again. 0% um, interest payments count towards public service loan forgiveness and the income driven plans, uh, as well as um, for borrowers that are in default, these months also count towards loan rehabilitation. So we're getting nine months of free payments for those, for that majority of federal student loan borrowers that whose loans fall under this. Unfortunately, nothing's been done still for that 20% of federal loan borrowers, and that's generally borrowers with federal family education loan program loans or Perkins loans or private loans um, that these provisions don't apply to. Those borrowers do still have to make payments. They still have interest accruing, et cetera. So it depends. So if you have that 20%, um, those 20% of federal loan borrowers, so the federal family education loan program or Perkins loan borrowers that these provisions don't apply to, there's actually quite a few options. You can contact the servicer and ask about an income-driven repayment plan or an unemployment deferment if you lost your job, uh, whether you lost your job due to the pandemic or not due to the pandemic. You don't even have to be completely jobless. You just have to be working less than 30 hours a week and actively pursuing full-time employment to get that unemployment deferment. There's also economic hardship deferment and other lower payment options that are available to you if you have those federal loans that, that the CARES Act and the executive order don't apply to. Private loans are a little trickier. Um, every single private loan program is different. Um, every lender is offering different things. Um, they're not as transparent as to what they're offering, but generally if you give them a call, uh, they'll let you know what might be available. I've seen some lenders that have um, offered interest only payments for a period of time under private loans, uh, or maybe even postponed payments. Sometimes they charge a fee for that. I haven't seen any of them do 0% interest, uh, but uh, the private lenders are being a little more generous with, with the assistance they're offering their struggling borrowers. If, if, if you have loans that are getting the 0% interest rate right now, you should absolutely be taking advantage of it. Um, assuming that you already have a good emergency fund in place and any other like high interest debt you might have, like credit card debt or so on, is taken care of, you know, every dollar that you pay towards your loans right now is essentially free money. So I would be trying to throw as much as you can um, at those loans, well, even if you're still in school. So almost every student loan borrower has at least some loans that are unsubsidized, which means they've been accruing interest since day one. So they might not be accruing interest right now, but there's a bunch of interest that's built up while you've been attending school. So again, use this opportunity to pay down that interest or pay down the principal is even better. Um, if you don't pay down that interest, once you do leave school and right before you go into repayment, that interest is actually going to be added onto your principal in the form of interest capitalization. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, take advantage of this opportunity to pay down that accrued interest or even better pay down the principal. I don't want to, I don't want uh, people to get discouraged if they don't have five grand to throw at your, their loans during this period even 20 bucks a month can make a, a big difference in the long term. So send what you can when you can send it is my advice. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest or someone you think we should talk to? Then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, and more, check out our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Don't forget, we're back again tomorrow. We'll all be joined by members of the media, financial services, and academia 
as we analyze all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, and more this week on the BRN Sunday podcast. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.